Our next guests have carved out a unique niche with their company, Spectre Vision, producing films that range from haunting horror to fantastical adventures. They are here at South by Southwest for a live version of their Visitations podcast, where they visit the homes and workshops of their favorite creators. Please welcome actor Elijah Wood and his producing partner, Daniel Noah, to the South by Southwest studio. How are we doing, fellas? Hi, really good. great. Thanks for having us. No, thanks for being on here. This is honestly a big honor for me because I was just talking about how, like, TikTok got me here, and now I'm, you know, sitting That's on the couch so cool, talking man. to you. It's really dope, you know? Like, dreams really do come true. Yes, they do. This is great. So talk to me about, like, your uh, Visitations podcast. Like, yeah. this is, in 2019, you traveled to the home of some of your favorite creators. Yeah. We're talking John Landis, Guillermo del Toro. Yep. Yeah. Like, what were some of your favorite moments from that mm. first season? It's got to be a ton. Mm. There was a moment, I think, that sort of, for us, solidified the tone and the format of the show, because mm. I think we were still sort of finding it. Like... In, in a way, we sort of said, okay, we wanna, we wanna go into people's homes, into mm. their spaces, have an intimate conversation that's outside of the context of a studio where they're not promoting anything, right. and let's get to something real within the context of that, and, and hoping to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Our second interview was with uh, Anna Lily Amirpour, and that interview achieved a degree of vulnerability and truth and honesty that really kind of shook us and and we were we were in awe of and appreciative of just her the the, the moment what we were able to capture we walked right. away from that feeling like okay th th this is the show this is yeah. what we th this is the the best that it can achieve is this sense of people just forgetting that they're being recorded yeah. and having a real intimate vulnerable conversation mm -hmm. about themselves and about their lives and how their lives have informed on their artistic process and other things. Right. Um, and that for us kind of like mm -hmm. really hit the, the nail in the head. Mm -hmm. And from there, we felt like we understood what the show was. Yeah. And, and at every point, every interview, every subsequent conversation, I think we were trying to get to those same places. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the way it's described in my head, like you guys remember MTV Cribs? Yeah, yeah of course. That, you know? Great show. <laughs> it's a great show. Yeah. But every time they would get to the private theater, I'm like, I want to know more about yeah. this. That's like, what, what what does it look like if you sit down and watch a movie in their home? That's and, like, awesome. You know, it's very intimate. Yes. And so, like, I want to know, like, what was the most interesting home that you've been to? Something that just sticks out. I mean, like, that's an easy one. Flying Lotus. Oh, I was going to say Guillermo del Toro. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, not yes. I mean, yeah. It was his, it was he literally, he's transformed his home into a, a museum. museum. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. that, and it's a really and incredible has, privilege to get in there. And it also, <laughs> elements of that space have traveled as a museum. Yes. His, his collection <laughs> of oddities and ephemera has literally been, has traveled the world at some of the finest museums in the world. Yeah, so yeah. it's, it's a, like, to get a golden ticket into that is incredible. It, it was mind-blowing. So, it's yeah. like the trolley. Chocolate, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but yeah. for like very creepy oddities, it, it, yes. it <laughs> like incredible way. prosthetics. It's yeah. got to be insane. And we were there for a few hours, and it felt like it was just scratching the surface. It did, mm -hmm. you know? yeah. But you, it was Fly Low for you. Fly, well, Flying Lotus, uh, really interesting home, but he's yes. transformed his home into his studio. Mm -hmm. So one kind of creative space leads to another creative right. space within the context of a really cool old kind of historic Los Angeles home. Right. Um, I just I, I found it kind of wonderful. And there's like a piano in one corner yeah. where he was, he was definitely experimenting a lot at the time with, with playing live piano rather than what he's known for. And uh, I remember it was raining that day that so and that nice. factored into the recording and it's something that you can hear. Um, all of those things kind of become the ephemera of these conversations, and yeah, I, I, like I really that. appreciate yeah, it creates that. creates more intimacy, as yeah, you yeah. say. Like, you feel like you're actually there that's in the, the moment. That, which that's is, the idea, is yeah. Is there any piece of, like, memorabilia from a particular house that if you, like, was allowed to take? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, for me, John Landis has um, toys from his movies, and he has this incredible die-cast Blues Brothers, Blues oh, yeah. Mobile, oh, blues that I was like, oh man, <laughs> I'd like to get my hands on that. I think Jake, little Jake and Elwood were, were in there. That was cool. Yeah, we're, we're in the car. Cool. Oh my God. I mean, there would have been any number of pieces from Bleak House to Guillermo's place. Mm -hmm. That would yeah. be amazing to have. It shocks me that like they actually live in the place where like all these things are, yeah. right? Like I have a couple of collectibles myself and sure. it's nowhere near museum level. Same. But you know, I walk by like my Batman Dark Knight like mm -hmm. returns like statue. Yeah. And I get a little yeah. Right, right? Yeah. But like <laughs> you know, yeah. but imagine being surrounded by it and just, you know, it's know. just who you are. It's yeah. incredible. I know, it's awesome. Uh so like after the first season, you guys took a pause. Mm -hmm. Uh what was the reason for that pause? 
I, look, the 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 show was sort of the show came to life because of our relationship with Shutter, the mm -hmm. streaming horror platform yes. whom we love um, and we have a close relationship with. Mm -hmm. um, they had a podcast initiative, and they were reaching out to friends and folks in the in the same creative community if they had ideas. And they reached out to us, and that's kind of where Visitations came to life. And then they their their sort of focus on podcasts kind of waned, and they focused more on the things that they were doing at the network um, and on the streaming platform. And it just kind of left us in limbo. We just didn't have necessarily a place to go. Right. Um, and then they gave us the space to sort of take it elsewhere, and that's kind of where we are now. And honestly, there was a pandemic. There was a, oh, there, yeah. there were a lot of other life things that happened in the, <laughs> yeah, in the, yeah, in the yeah, interim. Yeah, <laughs> hard to record a podcast with a mask. On yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but we awful. found a new, you know, a new partner. It's this company called Talent Entertainment, and and um, uh, and then we, you know, Shutter was very gracious about letting us take the rights, and yeah. Um, so yeah, we're uh, we're gearing up for a second season, and and you know, the Shutter version was very specifically focused on horror. Mm -hmm. I think for us the show has become more about the creative process in, in general. general so yeah. so we're opening it up and and to just be uh, interviews with anyone who creates and um uh and we had a yeah. really massive ongoing wish list from yeah. the first season yes, that we yeah. had uh, with hopefuls for season two that we're still like n now we can finally start to yeah. tick those boxes yeah. and finally get to meet those folks and yeah. There's, it's a long list. I mean, I, I hope this is something that we we can do many, many times over. Yeah. Um, the there's a lot of people we want to like talk Like you to. said, I'm sorry. No. But like you said about the screening room, you know, in the MTV Cribs is, is <laughs> like th this whole thing came from when, when we're coming up and, and thinking about, wondering about the lives of our idols, mm -hmm. you know, the idea that you could be a fly on a wall in the place where they create and hear them talking with their own contemporaries freely right. Um, you know, it's it's really different when you get out of a studio. Mm. Uh, um, uh, uh, it, it is was that idea. It was so exciting to us um, as you know, as young uh, dreaming artists, and we thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe we can create a record of that mm -hmm. kind of conversation yep. with people that we still look up to. And um, uh, so, so for yeah, for us, season two is like we're still dreaming. You know, mm -hmm. like who, like who are people we're curious about? We want to understand who they are. They're mm -hmm. enigmatic to us, yeah. and and have a chance to like sit down with them in their private space and and have a really honest conversation. It's a really really exciting. Mm. It's cool to have a curiosity over, like you said, like our idols and people that we've yeah. seen like create these amazing things that are really personal and cool to us. Yes, and then learning yeah. about them through like just being in their home and like the things that they love. It's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're go you mentioned the wish list mm -hmm. right, of people. Mm -hmm. Is there any way you can give us like some people that you have on that wish list, anyone you hope to interview uh, either on the podcast or even here at South by Southwest? I mean, I feel like there's a few people that we can mention that we may never ever get the chance. <laughs> like there's some, there's an artist that, <laughs> really? Okay, yeah, maybe we shouldn't. Like, maybe we we're, shouldn't. We're, we, we'll, we'll be releasing the name soon. Yeah, yeah, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair yeah, enough, so, fair yeah. enough. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. All right, I'll take that, and I'll just say, okay, I'll be looking for those list of names. Yeah. Really. Cool. <laughs> All right, so, you know, you guys, like, have past guests that are masters in the horror genre, right? Sure. And people have, like, this perception that, like, horror people are, like, very dark and very gloomy. Yeah, like, you know, they're so not. They're so not. I met Tim Burton once, and yeah. I was like, it was like, I was expecting him to be kind of creepy and kind of silent. He was just super chill and super lively, right? Yeah. Uh, what have you learned, like, looking through those masters of horror, like, when you got to interact with them, and, like, were there any surprises in, in their interactions with you, or? Well, we knew, you know, a I mean, lot of commonalities. A lot of commonalities. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, many of them were already friends, you know, people we right. knew, and... But I, I think the thing, yeah, the thing that's surprising about people who make dark art in general is how lovely mm -hmm. and well-adjusted they are. Yeah. And and I you know I think my theory about that is that the art becomes a kind of exorcism. Totally. It's like like, mm -hmm. they, like all of it's these therapy. twisted things right. that are like, inside. Yeah, you put it all out. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you put it out into the world, and then and then it's not in you anymore. And so you know people like David Lynch and David Cronenberg, you know they're they're very even kind of, <laughs> mm. you know, very solid, healthy people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and were they not making that art, mm -hmm. I imagine they might not be. Right. So it's healthy in that way. Potentially, yeah. yeah. The creative process is therapy. You said it earlier, yeah. you know, it just it happens that way. Yeah. Um, also, you just gave me like a funny visual of someone like going, the darkness inside of me, I must get it. Like, it's like the whole like anime thing. Yeah, where they yeah. Put it into like a yeah, movie. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm dead. I'm, I'm good for like a couple years. Right. <laughs> That's now I'm gonna think of Guillermo del Toro whenever he puts something new out. Yeah. Um, so 
in your opinions, what makes a horror film great? Like, what are some keys to the craft that you've picked up that you said, like, this is, these, this, these are the benchmarks here? Listen, there's all kinds of different horror movies that I think tick different boxes for people. Mm -hmm. It depends on what it is that you're trying to get out of it. But I think true greatness mm -hmm. is ultimately, I think, because this is an opinion, yeah. I think a true great horror movie is one where you can, and we say this a lot about the movies that we make, mm -hmm. but you can strip the genre elements away and you still have a compelling story. Right. That at the core of it, it's ultimately human and relatable. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that those films are far more frightening, far more engaging, and and leave a, a, a greater impression on you because mm -hmm. it's something that you can connect with, rather than simply just sort of having this exploitation right. experience, which has its merits yeah. as well. Yeah. But that's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think we we all, as you said, there's all different kinds of horror. We, we the films that we gravitate to, um, is it, is is very corny to say, but that they're all about love, mm -hmm. and and yeah. you know sometimes it's a dark journey to love, or sometimes it's about the absence of love. But mm -hmm. but they are they are ultimately um, about human relationships and and. Um, uh, they can actually be quite hopeful, a, a horror film, um, and and uplifting, and have very spiritual messages, and you know that you can you can address difficult issues in a genre film that you could not get away with if you were taking them on in a direct, literal way. Yeah. You know, like Shape of Water is a great example Absolutely. of that. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of ways you can read that metaphor. At, but but you know any way that you might apply that metaphor to a real relationship, if you were to depict that in a real way, it becomes a completely different kind of film that yeah. probably would not have been seen by as many people. Right. So you know it, it, it can, as, as we said earlier, it can be very therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to get like now. I really want to know some of your favorite horror films because yeah. you know some of my favorite horror films are things like Hereditary for reasons that you guys just said. Sure. Because it's all about the relationships. Yeah, totally. And that oh, family trauma. It, that one. Family <laughs> trauma, mental health, like yeah. all of these things. And yeah. then it follows. It does this thing that I like to say that Doctor Who does in their best horror episodes, which it takes like a regular basic human fear. Yeah. In this case, like being followed, right? Yeah. And it like amplifies it mm -hmm. and that's where the real horror lies right mm -hmm. you never know who's like behind yep. you and oh, following it's great it's Love it's incredible it. and they're doing a sequel they follow I know. I'm so very excited it's, it's about gonna it. be great but yeah. what are some of your favorite horror films that kind of like hit that mark for you uh i think one of the greatest of all time is john carpenter's the thing mm -hmm. um both cinematically it's also it's so it's so expansive but it's also so tight and yep. intimate it's yep. just this the confines of this space and the otherness mm -hmm. of the potentiality that there could be someone among you that's an alien is mm -hmm. just so powerful and effective. And, you know, Rob Boutin's makeup design and, and, and special effects are incredible. Oh, yeah. It's just yeah, yeah. A, a masterful <laughs> film. Um, and I always say that John Carpenter, again, Halloween is one of my all-time favorite mm -hmm. movies as well. Yep, yeah, I John just Carpenter's love a master. Yeah. There's a reason why people say that about him. What about, yeah. what about you? My favorite of all time is a film that is a little bit obscure, but is a uh, is a film from the '60s called *The Innocents*. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. which is an adaptation of *The Turn of the Screw* by Henry James. It was written by Truman Capote. It's a it's a ghost story. It's so um, great. Which is my personal yeah. favorite kind of sub genre of of tales of the supernatural. Okay, I, I love getting wrecked, so I'm gonna check that one out. It's great. Yeah, the, what was it called again? The Innocence. The, the Innocence, the Innocence. With a T. Yeah, yeah. Okay, The Innocence. <laughs> Not to Got be confused it. with a recent horror film with that name. It was starring Deborah Kerr. Right. Okay, well, cool. Well, now moving into Spectre Vision, can you give us like an update on it? Like, what are you like on top? Like, what are your top projects that you're working on these days? Well, we're, we're I mean, like many people who produce content, you know, we're coming out of a one-two punch of a pandemic and, and a strike. strike. Yeah. yeah. So, but, you know, uh, so we're, you know, feel like a slingshot that is ready to, um, <laughs> right know, fire. Post yeah. on we're post-production on, on a movie called yeah. uh, okay. Rabbit Trap, starring Dev Patel. Oh, cool. Um, who has Monkey Man premiering. Yeah, yeah I know. Tonight, yeah, yeah, we're yeah, super yeah. excited. We're going yeah. to that the premiere later. That movie looks incredible. It looks insane. It looks so yeah. good. <laughs> um, carry on. Sure, yeah. Ra Rabbit Trap's from a brilliant young, young filmmaker named Bryn Chaney. Um, and is, uh, it's funny you mentioned Doctor Who because it is an imagined story about uh, Daphne... Um, uh, uh, I've, I've forgotten her actual name because I'm only thinking Delia of her Derby character. Derbyshire. Derbyshire. Mm -hmm. Der, 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 Delia Derbyshire. 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 
uh, uh, who scored Doctor Who. Ooh. So there was this really interesting movement um, during that time in, uh, in London. It was called the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, and it was largely women who were making really innovative experimental electronic music. So mm. this is a horror film about a woman like that um, that um, is, is sort of unpacks a very mystical story about a marriage that unfolds in the world of sound. Wow. And um, okay. uh, it's with uh, Dev Patel and uh, Rosie McEwen and Jade Crute. Uh, it's a three-hander, and it's incredible. It's one mm, of my really favorite beautiful. films that we've worked on. So yeah, really that's in post that. right now, and, and we're really eager to, to get that out. And then we've, you know, we've got a long slate of stuff that we're looking that we're going to be shooting this year that we'll, you know, be able to talk about I'm soon. Pumped, man. Yeah. I'm like really getting giddy just <laughs> listening to it. Like, oh, hey. bring them all on. <laughs> Uh, so as you guys know, like when it, we talked a lot about like the creative process and the, things of that sort, like mm -hmm. obviously there's now kind of something coming in that's like disrupting it, which is AI, right? And mm -hmm. like how do you see AI like affecting something like Spectre Vision and like just filmmaking as a whole in the future? Oh man, it's so hard to tell like where this is all going to go. Um, you know, I think AI as a tool is going to be very useful mm -hmm. and it's already clear to see what some of those applications could be. I think in terms of like how it could upend the film industry or change the film industry. I think it's really difficult to know. Um, I think at the end of the day, people are, are, are always going to gravitate towards what feels authentic and real. I think we'll always deal in human stories from an authentic point of view. Mm -hmm. So the idea of making something purely AI, I, I don't know, yeah. but maybe there's also an artistic expression there. We're, we're, we're standing at the precipice, you know? It's really difficult to yeah sort of prognosticate, you know, from mm -hmm. this vantage point in it's terms of where things are going to go. Territory and right. I feel like it's it's going to be it's going to be wild. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we're about to see things that we could only sort of dream of mm -hmm. um, come to pass, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's obviously it's a controversial subject. It, it, it's I agree with Elijah. I think the essence of art is expression of human individuality, and yeah. that can never be recreated by AI. And if it can, we have bigger problems, right? Right? Yeah. Than, than right. movies. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like Will Smith and I robot. Good, good I'm like, yeah. You know? yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but you know what? I think what can't be overstated is the uh, impact it will have on jobs. Right, and yeah. so well, I, I which I, is already happening. It's already happening. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so I think well, well, people like us who tell stories for a living, I mm. personally don't feel threatened by it, but I'm very aware of how many people will perhaps not have job opportunities right. anymore, and that part is painful. Yeah, well, I think as long as like people continue to kind of like fight the good fight when it comes to like striking and things of that sort, like yeah. what happened with the actors and writer strike, I think you know. Again, we don't know what's going to happen, mm -hmm. but there's some silver lining, like you know, optimism that you can have towards that, right? Sure. Uh, yeah. Speaking of like actors, like Elijah, do you have anything like coming up on the acting front? Like, what's next for you? Uh, well, at some point, um, <laughs> the Toxic Avenger remake will probably come out. So the um, <laughs> Macon Blair wrote and directed a remake of the Toxic Avenger, which is a, mm. a trauma um, sort of superhero movie from the yeah. '80s. Uh, a very gory superhero movie um, that we shot a couple years ago. It premiered at Fantastic Fest here in Austin right, last right. year um, and did a screening at Beyond Fest and it, it Legendary produced it. So at some stage this year it'll come out. I'm not sure what the release plan is. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah I've been hearing it like roaming around like the circuits and everything. It's great. Yeah. It's so fun and ridiculous and <laughs> uh, I'm super stoked for people to see it. So that, that'll come out sometime this year. All right, cool. Well, yeah. that's a nice little plug to end on for yeah. you then. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining the South by Southwest studio, guys. Thank you so much Thanks for having us. This is great. Well, Elijah and Daniel were here and thanks you for coming by to watch them. You can catch all of our interviews on the South by Southwest YouTube page. That's youtube.com slash XSXW. I hope I got that right. I'm Juju Green. Thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs> that was great. Thanks. Awesome. That was great, man.